Hey y'all, Farmer Jesse here. I've been doing some consults lately and I've been thinking if I could go back in time and start a no-till market garden from scratch, I'm knowing what I know now, the tools that are out now, what would I buy? What do I think are the bare essentials? Where would I generally put my investments? That's what I wanna talk about today. Would I buy the quick cut greens harvester? Is that a great first tool? Would I do soil blocks? So let's do it. All right, so there are kind of maybe six main areas that I would say are the most important for me in retrospect to focus on. You have soil prep, seed starting, season extension and pest management, harvesting, storage, and marketing, or this one. Those are kind of the six main areas I think need the most focus. So let's just start with soil management. So that soil management, soil prep, you could do this a million different ways, but on a, if I could go back in time and do it, this is the bare essentials, right? This is what I think you would need at the absolute minimum, would be compost. You need some decent compost, so you have to find a composter. A wheelbarrow, you need a bed rake, a bed roller, and possibly a tarp, and possibly a mower. So, or you can have your neighbor do it. So there are many ways to prep ground, but essentially I would just use that to mow, place a tarp over, kill any grass, place my compost over into beds, rake those, roll them, and then I'm ready for the next most important part, seed starting. You do not have to do all of your own seeds. That's a lot of work. And in, in some cases, it may not be the most profitable way to do it. And when I say seeds, I mean starts, like doing your own broccoli or doing your own tomatoes. It takes a certain level of expertise and it does take some infrastructure. So for beginners, I almost, if you don't have a good greenhouse and you don't have a lot of experience with starting seeds, I almost recommend buying your first round of plants. It's more expensive, but if you go with somebody like Banner or one of the other propagation houses, you can actually get really good starts. You can get them exactly when you want them and they're in really great condition. You just take them out of the trays and put them in the soil. So for seed starting, I would say, just build a small greenhouse for just a handful of things. Focus more on crops that you can direct seed and any crops you can't, order those. That's, that's what I would, if I could go back and do it, I think that's how I would do it. Uh, cedars, would I buy a Jang? I don't know yet. I haven't got to use the Jang, we just ordered it. But I know that the Earthway has served me well up until this point. So I can't say whether or not I would buy a Jang right away, but I can say that the Earthway is fine for most things. If you're doing a lot of baby greens, you may wanna look at one of those pinpoint cedars or really going for it and get one of the multi-row cedars, the six row, the four row, the multiple Jang, JP5, I think it's called. Any of those, you could think about doing that. Yeah, think about getting a better cedar. It's not a bad idea. I also can't really comment on the paper pot yet. We also just ordered those, so I'll be able to test those for you and let you know later on. As far as cell trays go, I really like anything that is a wind strip or like a wind strip. That's cool. Soil blocks. Would I do soil blocks again? That's a good question. I think I would do so I would buy one or two standing soil block makers and I love soil blocks, so I probably would do that. And also in terms of seed starting, maybe the last thing, I would buy a great soil mix. If you're gonna do your own seed starting, you really have to invest in good soil mix. I think that is an absolute essential element. If you're not doing your own seeds, you're ordering them, it's not as big of a deal. If you are doing your own transplants, gotta get good soil mix. Season extension is kind of interesting. I think that every, if you don't have a greenhouse right away, or if you haven't quite got your NRCS grant for the high tunnels, which still is around, you need to look at the NRCS, National Resource Conservation Service, and check them out. They will basically reimburse you entirely for a high tunnel. So you can get a high tunnel that way, but it doesn't happen fast. It doesn't happen immediately. So I think that investing in a cat tunnel from Farmer's Friend or building your own or however you want to do it, is a great, is, is an essential part of the first year or two on the farm. And that does pretty much go for anywhere you live. Uh, even in warmer climates where you don't need it, it offers a little bit of shade and a little bit of weather protection. And it's great for trellising tomatoes. You, to, field tomatoes can be great but flavor-wise, but they can also be really hard to manage if you get a lot of rainfall, like we do in Kentucky, where we got 70 inches of rain last year. 
that's real, that really happened. So a little, some hoops, we build these little hoops. You, you can see this little video of Further and I. Basically, I buy, I think it's 12 gauge wire that you get for fencing, pull it out to about 54 inches and then you cut it and then you just form your hoops that way and then I put those out at about five or six feet apart and I stretch row cover depending on how cold it's gonna get. Sometimes I'll double it up. Um, but yeah, you put row cover over top of that and it essentially just keeps the you know frost off the, immediately off of the plants because if the row cover freezes and it's touching the plants, that can obviously kill the plants. So those two things, caterpillar tunnel and a some sort of row cover system is really good. You know, that's just some amount of season extension will benefit you at the market greatly. And it can also double as insect netting. So if you want to get an insect netting or if you want to use one of the lighter row covers in the spring as insect netting, that works really well too. So it's, in terms of pest protection, that's really important. Harvesting. Would I get something like the Quick Cut Greens Harvester, which is I think five or $600? It's expensive. Is it something I would buy immediately? Mm. If I'm doing baby greens, if that's gonna be my game plan, a lot of lettuces, a lot of spinaches, a lot of arugula, absolutely. I mean, I cannot emphasize how much time that saves you. It's ridiculous how fast that thing is. Absolutely, it's a great tool. If you're not doing a lot of baby greens, then I would say no, don't get it. It's not worth it. You can do. If you're just doing some Salanova lettuce or something, do it by hand. That tool is great, but it's not gonna pay for itself unless you're doing more baby greens. Then you're gonna need some knives and some bins. One thing about bins I think about is you need a, you need like kind of a shallow bin for tomatoes if you're doing big tomatoes or even just putting, I like to put our pints as I harvest them into those bins and then stack those bins and that's how we bring them to market. You know, if cherry tomatoes and any sort of saladette tomatoes. I kind of wish I had more of, originally bought more of those kind of deep totes with about a 18 inch base, 14 inch, 18 inch base just a bunch of those for greens and lettuce greens and I'll often put our carrots inside of those and put them in the cooler that way. That so simple and in terms of harvesting, they fit right in the pathways really well as opposed to those, those even those shallow yellow bins that we have. They don't fit in the pathways as well so they can be a little bit more, I don't know, tougher. But I would also just get one bin of each. I would get the shallow one and the deep one and I wouldn't get any sort of mix because having that mixture, you have to find different places to put them. They don't stack well. I would focus on that for sure. And if I have a little extra money, a harvest cart. A harvest cart, I recommend that one. I also regret not having a better root washing station last year. So in terms of harvesting, I would actually build out, just put you know a nice little graded four by eight thing on top of some cinder blocks is fine for washing carrots and washing beets and washing turnips. That's great. So I actually kind of remodeled ours this year to make it more permanent. Uh, as you can see in this little clip. And I just think that's huge. Like that's an essential part of a farm. You spend so much time washing stuff. So that part of the harvesting is extremely important. On, on top of the harvesting stuff, you'll also want, you know, your wash pack stuff. You definitely want a place to wash your greens, you need big tubs, preferably a bubbler. We don't have one, it's great to have one, but a place that you can dip your greens and then a place you can spin them. So you can get a hand spinner, but if you're doing any amount of greens, try and build yourself a spinner. It's gonna change your life. Now, that's probably the bare essentials for harvesting, but I can think of a few more things in terms of the wash pack that you may want, but if you can get away with your first year with that, pretty sure. And then, storage. You're gonna need some amount of storage. You can do this with coolers. If you have a deep freezer and you can keep bottles of ice, you could do all this with coolers your first year. You don't need to build like a cooler, like a walk-in cooler, although they're great. We, Hannah and I lived off grid and we had a friend who had a deep freezer, so we would go over there and freeze our ice and every week we'd come, just get collect all of our ice and put it into coolers and cool all of our stuff that way. Yeah, and it sucked, but it worked. So technically you could do that too. But you could also just insulate a room and put a cool bot in it with an air conditioner and that would be awesome. Those are great. We have one, it works wonderfully and uh, it keeps everything to the temperature we want it. I do recommend going with a higher BTU, maybe more like 12,000. We started with 8,000 in this past year and that was okay. Could get it down to 50 degrees, 45 degrees, which is great for tomatoes, not great for greens. So oh, just think about that. That's important to consider when you're trying to cool your vegetables down. All right. And then marketing.
Figure out what your vegetables are and how you're gonna package them. So you're gonna have to buy packaging. We can talk about where to get packaging and all that stuff later. In fact, any questions you have, if I kind of skip over something or if I just mention some jargony thing, hit me in the comments, let me know, and I'll try and explain myself a little bit more. And also, if you have anything to add, if you feel like, oh, you should also use this, this is a something I think is essential, feel free to do that too. Like for instance, I didn't mention the broad fork in soil prep, which I think is kind of a, can be a really essential tool in certain soils, in other soils it may not be, so it may depend on your soil organic matter and your clay content and all those sorts of things, so just think about that. Anyway, marketing. You're gonna need a scale, a good scale, uh, Almost regardless, you're gonna need it for your market, but you're also gonna need it for pack, wash pack. So a good scale for marketing, you're gonna need all of your tent, your booth, your tables, your tablecloths, your signage, all of those things. Those are essential. If you're doing a farmer's market, you gotta have those. You also need a website. Also need social media, which usually isn't expensive unless you're doing ads. Social media will let you sign up for free. They will just charge you to actually get any sort of traction on your posts. I'm looking at you, Facebook. Yeah, any sort of bags, berry containers, rubber bands, all that stuff. You just gotta think about that. Because here's the other thing about all this. Like, I say the bare essentials, and I've listed quite a few things. You could maybe do with a little bit less than that. That's kind of what I feel like are the minimum. And still, I mean, some of that stuff is kind of exp can be kind of expensive. I think that per acre, you're probably looking at a minimum. If you have land and you have some covered space to wash pack your vegetables, a minimum of $10,000. I really think it's better at about 18. So that's another thing. I think the bare minimum capital that you need is probably 10 or $15,000. I know it's a lot, but I don't want anybody to ever forget that you're also starting a business. Think of farms in this really romantic context. It is a business. Don't forget that. That's super important. Think about, think about it like you're starting a record shop. Like what, you're still gonna have to have some amount of upfront capital to get it going. Anyway, yeah, like I said, let me know what you guys think are the bare minimum. Let me know if you have any questions about what I said. Of course, like this video. If you like this video, make sure to subscribe to the podcast, to this YouTube channel, to everything. Share these YouTube videos. That's super helpful. Share the podcast, share the videos. Don't forget to sign up for the Patreon page. But you got that. You already know about all that stuff. You guys are good. Neighbors are banging on stuff. Probably a good time to start wrapping it up. So, thanks you all. We'll see you next week. Bye. You wanna cut it one time? No, no. Okay.